uh, for the year and I'm really pleased to be hosting on this occasion. Uh, I'm Martin Woods. I'm the I was, I was about to say, I am the curator of maps at the National Library, but of course I'm not. I, I recently retired, but I am still president of the National, of the Australian and New Zealand Map Society. So um, I'm welcoming you in that capacity, uh, but no longer as some uh, person chiefly responsible for the maps collection at the um, uh, National Library. Um, so, what I'd like to um, do is welcome uh, each of our panelists uh, and speakers today. Uh, we've had three webinars this year, and um, I'm anticipating that um, this session will be slightly different from our um, previous ones. In that we are, in the past, we have um, managed to do a thematic or topical webinar, and on this occasion, we're having a, an informal conversation with. Um, several important um, and uh, talented curators, librarians, and those responsible for map collections around Australia and New Zealand. So I welcome you all um, to um, Andrew Black at the State Library of Western Australia, uh, David Jones at University of Melbourne, uh, Igor Drecke uh, from uh, National Library of New Zealand, um, Karen Craw, formerly of the Hocken Collection, um, Maggie Patton, State Library, New South Wales, and Sarah Ryan at State Library, Victoria. Um, welcome to you all and thanks very much for, for joining us today. The way we're going to run the session is we're going to hear a little bit about um, these people and their collections. We're then going to move on um, and maybe talk about some of the things that are uh, challenges and opportunities in, in the way in which they work um, and, the, and the kinds of collections that they are managing. And then finally, uh, hear a little bit about the innovations that um, some uh, uh, and opportunities there that uh, some, some of those collections have made available to uh, our speakers. So let's move on um, and I'm just going to throw to uh, Andrew um, Andrew Black at State Library of Western Australia and Andrew could you tell us a little bit about your role and and the collections that you manage okay based at the State Library I've been in the role basically last probably about eight nine years but uh, it was originally my primary role is actually collection uh, collection liaison for uh, subscriptions and online resources but because of my background and stuff like that I've actually got some oversight in the maps co uh, collections of the State Library. Over the last few years it's significantly changed from a general reference collection primarily. We're looking towards more what we call the heritage collection of maps which are the West Australian related titles and publications. I try and broaden that out to include Australia a bit more broadly but it's a bit of a, narrow, a more narrow focus than what we had previously, where we had collections of the rest of the world and stuff that way. Um, and ultimately, because of that, we have not as much availability of what's actually out there in, from Maps point of view. We do have probably about two or three major publishers of Maps in WA, and they relate to government and one private industry so we're probably collecting our material from uh, eastern states and abroad for get extra materials i do have a keen interest and in one thing we do look at is probably more the historical west australian maps or maps that relate to west australia in one way like a few years ago we actually picked up things from the sort of uh 1800s from the dutch indian company and those sort of things where they had the wa focus of material for that material. Moving into the more current type things, uh, we are looking at digital maps and we're looking at getting those through the National E-Deposit Scheme and getting those onto that platform to make them available to uh, ideally within the library and broader, but there are limitations on permissions depending on what publishers have. We have had some success with that with the local Department of Transport, which are depositing the hydrographic charts they produce on a regular basis. And because of the way they're produced on a more up-to-date basis, they update them available when they made updates. We've got an agreement that we actually archive them once a year. So we've got a snapshot of what they are. We can't justify getting them to pour in every time they make an update. So we make them available that way. 
and that's where I'll go from now. Over to you. Thanks, um, Andrew. Um, we'll go alphabetically. David, it's your turn. Uh, all right, I'll introduce myself. Uh, David Jones, I'm the librarian, map librarian, the University of Melbourne. Uh, the Melbourne University Collections got about 130,000 sheet maps and about 10,000 books and atlases. Uh, we span the entire world, everywhere, every when, uh, and we've got a fair collection of fantasy maps to help our student clubs as well. Star Wars maps, Polkan maps, uh, etc. Star Trek, yeah, we've got the Star Trek archive, uh, Game of Thrones, we've got Game of Thrones movie material, their map markers from the movie, like one-to-one -one reproductions. So we've got very wide material. Uh, I'm nominally uh, in charge of access to that. Uh, I've also uh, do at the Melbourne University um, GIS uh, resources. Uh, I cover a lot of GIS material and that's probably my main focus at the moment and has been for the last 10 years is lecturing and teaching and doing consultations with researchers and students uh, about a lot of GIS uh, and digital material and getting material into the, the digital sphere. Um, I've also kind of the knowledge person for the aerial photography so all of the aerial photography descriptions uh, that we maintain and the aerial photography material in the library and the map collection, uh, I kind of the resource person for that. Additionally, due to historical reasons, I also the consultation person for the ABS, Australian Bureau of Statistics material as well. So when people want to make thematic maps or bring material and mash material up with statistics, uh, I get a lot of those uh, in, in inquiries from our students and researchers. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty busy. Um, I've, I'm getting lots of inquiries constantly. Uh, I don't stop uh, in, in most days. Um, one of the challenges for us at the moment is that during the pandemic last year, uh, my building, the building that the map collection had been situated in for the last oh, nearly 30 years, uh, they just, you know, it was uh, the crunch time came to renovate it and we had to move the entire collection mid last year during lockdown, during the pandemic, and we had to move the entire collection out of there into the various you know, storage facilities that we'd maintained uh, or prepared and that wasn't of course enough and deal with all of the problems associated. So yeah, that was a huge problem. Uh, and now I'm nominally situated in the Bayou Library and the collection will be accessed uh, through the reading room in the Bayou Library. Thanks uh, very much, David. Um, uh, Igor, you're next and I believe you have um, taken up your current role quite recently. That's correct. I started in April this year. So Alexander Turnbull Library, which is part of the National Library, has got 10 major curatorial areas, each managing a specific collection, uh, maps obviously being part of it. The curator, cartographic and geospatial collection has responsibilities for developing and promoting collection across historical map collections to contemporary geospatial data. This includes um, uh, the development of collections, providing research services, publishing research into libraries collections, developing exhibitions, uh, contributing to the library's digitization programs and maintaining links with various communities of interest. In other words, we are looking after New Zealand cartographic heritage and trying to illuminate the way cartography is contributing to shaping the nation and touching the hearts and minds of New Zealanders. I certainly hope that that focus of the curatorial role will not change uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future, at least. Regarding the volumes, um, from uh, mid-70s, we had about 11,000 sheet maps or cartographic items in the collection. Uh, by now, this, uh, this collection grew eightfold and mainly uh, due to the, to the Na National Library becoming the legal deposit. The library, so a lot of uh, materials coming our way by default. We've got uh, around 16,000 manuscript maps, um, 24,000 digitized uh, maps. It's not a huge collection, uh, but it's quite significant with regards to New Zealand setting. 
Thank you, Martin. Thanks, Igor. Um, and uh, over to you, Karen. Hi there, I'm um, recently retired from my position as a map curator at the Hocken Collections. The Hocken Collections are a branch of the University of Otago Library, a research branch which is um, non-lendable, but um, we, we don't have a big digitization project as program as yet, but of course with EGOS, the NDHA, we've uh, actually got a lot of online maps that, that I use um, used for my research questions. Um, so in the end, I guess it was quite a lot of directional um, information required by researchers in our collection, which would use the NDHA, National Digital Heritage Collection, and Trove and such like, and was end up just the trying to find information for people online. And so it was more of a like, information retrieval job, but um, it is uh, a specialist research collection uh, with New Zealand, Australasian, Antarctic and uh, maps collected of, in areas that we might have, New Zealand might have been involved in, such as the Vietnam War and, you know, Mount Everest, of course. Um, uh, well, I have 16,000 maps, so it's not a big collection, but each item was catalogued to item level, not the big, um, you know, series collections that the state libraries have got. Uh, it was started off by Dr. Hockham, which is why it's called the Hockham Collections, and he was a, a local doctor in about the turn of the century, 1900 century, and he collected a lot of material and um, to do with early New Zealand. He wasn't a great map collector, but we have built on his collection. Um, and we became part of the university library at one stage. And I've been, I had been there for quite a long time. So I'd been through three buildings, started in the museum and um, then to the uh, Richardson building and then to our own uh, building. Um, uh, we have an art gallery uh, photos, maps, newspapers, periodicals, books, um, archives, and the map collection includes um, a, quite a large number of manuscript maps as well. Uh, we have researchers, of course, uh, part of our job, a major part of our job is to support university staff and students um, as, with um, historical research, but not just historical, there's also um, the surveying department geography, geology, biology, they use um, our maps uh, to show a timeline of changes, which is quite often not available in other ways. Um, and we have international researchers. Uh, we have collection, the collection of maps, which I was responsible for. Uh, it's not just historical, we also add to them. Uh, we don't have copyright deposit like Turnbull does, but um, we try to collect extensively for Otago and Southland, but also we're a national collection. Um, so I was uh, responsible for the complete care of a collection. So there was all the ordering, cataloging, storage, conservation, research, um, cataloging, full, full, full individual unique cataloging on OCLC. Um, I think that probably, I probably missed quite a lot of things there, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> uh, ex excellent coverage. Thanks, um, Karen. I appreciate that. Um, we're going to come back this side of the ditch, uh, the side that I'm on, and uh, cross to Maggie. Maggie, I think you're muted still. Isn't that a tragic thing to be doing at this point of um, Zoom history? Um, yeah, Maggie Patton, I'm at the State Library of New South Wales. Um, it, we have um, a big collection of maps here. We started collecting back in the 1820s, actually. I was doing some work recently on the Australian Subscription Library, and, and there were quite a lot of maps and atlases when the library opened in um, 1826. Uh, so we have a big historical cartography collection um, of, uh, dating back to you know, the 14th century. Lots on the on the gradual exploration and um, surveying, etc., of the Southern Hemisphere, BOC, all of that sort of thing. We also have then a lot of original maps um, and um, early maps of um, 
Australia and exploration and inland settlement uh, around Sydney. We've got fantastic collection of subdivision plans. So all of the usual box and dice. We're a legal deposit library, so we get all of the maps that are published in New South Wales. Uh, uh, we're also getting digital maps as well through the legal national legal e-deposit system. Um, we um, so I think everything is catalogued really well, except our hydrographic charts. So we have a big backlog of uh, bag, backlog of um, hydrographic charts, which hopefully next year we'll be able to tackle it. Um, it's not so much that we don't have it, it's just you really can't discover it on the catalogue. We've done some major digitisation over the last 10 years or so. So a lot of material is digitised and available through our catalogue. Um, so um, it's usually discoverable. My role here is I am a manager of um, a team called Research and Discovery which is basically a curatorial team. So I lead a team of curators um, with various um, expertise in um, manuscripts, pictures, maps, rare books, but each of us has a particular subject expertise. And so my area is maps and rare books, and I've been working with the map collection since 2009. I, I say um, that before 2009, I probably answered two inquiries in the reading about maps, but I managed to get the position and hopefully have gone on a huge upwards trajectory since then. Um, at the moment, um, our roles as curators are about researching the collections. We acquire material for the collections. We assist researchers with the collection. Uh, we also help with um, promotion through social media, through the website. Uh, we do a lot of uh, a lot of media inquiries. We do lots of um, exhibitions, all that box and dice that a usual curator would have done. But we, we I am not called a maps curator, but um, it's that particular area of expertise. Um, I think uh, I'll leave it there, and we'll just get to everything else as we go on. Martin, do you think? Yeah, it sounds like a great idea. Thanks, Maggie. And uh, last but not least, Sarah. Hi there. Um, so I am in the collection curation and engagement team at the State Library of Victoria and uh, my expertise is in the map collection. Uh, very similar to, to Maggie in that I am in a curatorial team uh, that spans multiple special collections and uh, we are a legal deposit library so we acquire a copy of every map published in Victoria uh, so that is the, the primary focus of our collection but that said we have a significant collection of maps of all of Australia uh, the other states and territories um, international maps we have a large antique collection of maps uh, showing early outlines of Australia um, and also maps that are putting Victoria and Australia in the wider global context. Uh, so we have collections like UK ordnance surveys. So as a British colony, uh, we have strong links there. We have um, British hydrographic charts um, and the bread and butter of the collection, very similar to State Library of New South Wales. We have uh, parish plans of when mm. towns and suburbs started being divided up when land was being sold by the government. Um, we also have an amazing collection of drainage plans, which were produced by the Melbourne Metropolitan Board of Works uh, from the 1890s onwards. So my team is responsible for the building uh, and promotion of, of the state collection. Uh, so yes, that is including the special collections like uh, newspapers, rare books, maps, uh, but also all of the legal deposit collection as well. And um, we engage people with the collection, uh, get it out there so people know that it's there. Um, and that people have a connection to their heritage and um, record at the State Library. 
Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and thanks everybody for giving us such a uh, interesting outline and a few things have emerged there for me and my thinking and, and listening to you all and what different institutions you run, although there are some similarities. Um, what I'd like to do now is open up the conversation a little bit to the challenges and opportunities that you feel you face. And for my part, I, I would say as well that my role, a little bit like Maggie's and Sarah's in a, in a big um, map library, such as the National Library of Australia has, um, which has both historical and current digital um, material is, you know, there are a range of challenges. These can be funding and budget um, philanthropy, um, they can be structural issues that we face, some um, staffing expertise, um, all sorts of issues come up as you try to manage um, such those kinds of collections, and including keeping up with both the, uh, particularly the um, geospatial and uh, digital mapping as well. I'm kind of interested as in listening to Sarah and Maggie, uh, the National Library of Australia recently went through a structural change, speaking of one of those challenges, and we moved from what was uh, a maps collection managed by maps experts, um, which managed every aspect of map um, um, management from the stack um, through to acquisition and all the way to outreach and promotion to uh, a structure which is functional so that the rest of the library manages um, some of those other aspects. And we, we I say we, uh, were responsible for um, the acquisition only um, and nothing else. And I, I'm interested to see whether Maggie, perhaps, or Sarah, you had any thoughts about, um, you've recently been through those kinds of functional structural changes. Would you like to comment? Um, I might, uh, we went through our restructure back in 2014. And so it's sort of matured since then. So you can look at it in a different way, perhaps, than a restructure that's quite recent. And um, certainly we have a lot to do with the acquisition. I have something to do with the acquisition of maps, but there are other people. We have a separate function. So acquisition is a completely separate team. And some of those people deal with maps. So I will work with them around with maps and I will do some. So it's sort of a distributed model for the acquisition, but all of the cataloging goes to an, a cataloging team completely separate. And um, I think it's a bit scary in some ways because you sort of have to sort of bid almost <laughs> to say, hey, I've got a new map here. It really needs to be cataloged. Can you do that for me? And of course they may have other priorities. But, you know, I suppose it's how you manage that relationship. But, you know, the cataloging team, they have people that are experts on doing maps. So I suppose the expertise um, spreads differently. And it's really about your ability to negotiate and create those rela relationships across the other teams because there's weaknesses and strengths in everything. Um, uh, I would certainly not catalog a map. You wouldn't want me going anywhere near a map. The reading rooms have always handled inquiries separately and you've already had a couple of, you've always had people in the reading rooms who deal with maps, uh, that sort of thing. I think the issue is um, in the reading rooms is getting people interested in maps. I don't think it's ever changed. People coming up to the desk and asking about maps, the people behind the desk get scared. Oh my God, they're asking for a map. And I think it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't matter what your structure is, strangely enough, that still happens. And so that thing about demystifying maps is really important, no matter what your structure is. Thanks, Maggie. Would anyone else like to build on what Maggie has just um, shared with us? I would echo Maggie's sentiments. Uh, the State Library of Victoria went through a very similar restructure uh, a few years after the State Library of New South Wales. Um, so like them, we have separate teams for acquisitions, for cataloging, um, but I still have a big say in mm. what's purchased um, and also uh, not just the uh, heritage maps, but also um, more contemporary um, acquisitions as well. I, I think there was some concern at the time that we would lose a say in that, but we've retained that 
which is good. Um, and I think there's uh, been a real, uh, I suppose, grappling, but with um, specialisation and, and generalisation with these types of restructures. So um, within my team, we are full of experts in, in different areas, um, but the trend is that we are learning more about each other's collections within that team. Uh, so while you, you've got your expertise, you're, you're stretching yourself into other areas, um, which I actually, I actually like, um, but then you, you kind of do lose a bit of that, that specialization. So I think that tug of war is, is, is playing out. Um, and we had a, um, a restructure and a building redevelopment uh, happening concurrently, um, which was pretty destabilizing. And then when um, the building redevelopment had finished and uh, the restructure uh, was being um, bedded down, um, the pandemic hit. So we're kind of feeling like, okay, this restructure is a few years old, but we haven't really had the chance to um, get into our, our, new, our new functions. So we're definitely still dealing with that. And um, one of the outcomes of the restructure is a lot of people who are working uh, with collections, librarians, senior librarians like myself, uh, who have spent you know, many years cutting our teeth on the reference desk um, are no longer uh, working front of house. So it's kind of a, a different engagement um, with our audiences. Uh, we still do uh, assist staff uh, and clients directly with these kind of reference inquiries, but we're not we're not at the front line. So uh, our main role now uh, is engaging groups outside the lot, special groups. They could be student groups, or um, we've actually got a new Indigenous Research Centre at the library. So um, there are First Nations peoples who are really interested in doing some family history research. Uh, and there are a lot of maps that are, that use, that are useful for that, that kind of purpose. And um, libraries have really broadened um, their scope um, and are now offering all sorts of different, different services. So, I'll, I'll throw over to some other people to give uh, other people a chance to talk about it. Um, but yeah, lots happening. It, it, it's challenging, um, but never a dull moment. I, I heard the word engagement used many times in both your um, recap and, uh, and Maggie's just previously, Sarah. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that Igor's and David's experience of engagement is somewhat different. Am I wrong there, Igor? Not to the great extent. Um, I think that uh, engagement with various communities is something at the heart of what we're trying to do also in our curatorial teams. One of the most recent actually examples is the Geospatial Data for New Zealand seminar that Alexander Turnbull Library organized together with the New Zealand Cartographic Society. And I'm not hiding that the idea for for the topic of this particular seminar were sparked by, by this new curatorial sort of drive in expanding the what was traditionally cartographic collection into cartographic and geospatial. So the understanding of what is being um, looked at uh, or looked up to the library to, to serve into the future is being addressed and being actually um, the intelligence is is somehow collected from the people that that produce this this um, uh, these geospatial uh, resources in order to then build on that and and uh, move on with collecting. We are at the very beginning of this road. We uh, we've got only one truly geospatial data set in in our collection. It is. Uh, um, lava caves in Oakland, and this is a laser scan of the lava caves. But we are moving into the direction of, of obviously building uh, a much larger presence in, in this area. Um, 
there is a talk amongst, and that's something that Sarah mentioned about um, cross fertilizing different um, curatorial areas. The same happens here that we've got a very dynamic team that actually engages with various communities, obviously targeting specific um, uh, uh, specific um, groups of interest. But at the end of the day, all contributes to the same expertise that is offered by the library as a whole, rather than actually just uh, separated into very distinct siloed sort of expertise areas. Mm. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, um, Igor. That's, uh, that's uh, different and, and yet Obviously, you need to reach out to um, many communities, and I can see that road ahead for you. Um, David, I would think yours is still different again, um, although that in principle, you need to be doing that. Um, your audience is, to some great degree, um, fixed for you. Yeah, um, my role, for at least for the last seven years, has been a teaching focus. So I haven't done, I had a curatorial role, role, unlike many of you. So it's not been focused on looking after or, or increasing, expanding the collection. It's best definitely been on engaging with the students and academics uh, community um, through various means, whether that's social media or any other uh, alive in lectures and what have you, but it's about a, a, it's a real teaching role and education role. Uh, it's not not so much a curatorial role. Uh, we leave that to the state libraries and and the others uh, to maintain and uh, keep all of our collections and material. Um, historically, Melbourne Uni had a, already had a huge and has a huge collection of material, um, and so with the advent of GIS and the steady decreasing of the publishing of paper material, uh, we definitely changed our focus from collecting and the collection to a much more engagement focus uh, with our teaching community, with our, with our research and teaching community. Thanks, David. I wonder whether Karen or Andrew um, would like to say perhaps how their um, historical collections um, have fitted into the bigger picture and, um, you know, is there a, uh, or has there been uh, opportunities there to engage with geospatial um, using your historical collections? Uh, it's Andrew. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an interesting area. So, so, the, so from a collection point of view, we're trying to make, as with COVID and everything, it's making a rather than people coming into the building, trying to actually make it uh, available to people outside the building, whether that's a digitized of the older historic maps, which for example, we've got an 80 chain series of maps, which are of interest because they were done very early on. They include the uh, land arrangements and who owned the maps and people doing family history would be very interested in those. So making those broad, more broadly available. So that includes basically a digitization of those and making them available. At the moment, we don't have a platform to actually make that apart from through the website. So it's making the catalog record more identifiable, searchable, the index records available. So encouraging through the website to explain to people what we actually have and what's actually available and encouraging people to ask questions and going forward. And ideally you do something like what Martin's been doing at the National Library with Map Search. So you can bring those together in a searchable way outside of a word-based search. And to me that's would be ideal to have maps as a base is of your searching and then things that link to places or whatever can be also searched on that met method going forward. Thanks, Andrew. That's that's good to hear. And, um, you know, we should talk about map search one time. Um, uh, Karen, I wonder whether you had anything to add on um, that? Well, we, we, we cater to the public and the university. So we have um, people coming in a lot to do family research and... Um, write books and we, we um, my one of my main roles was recently has just been get stuff catalogued because I've had a huge backlog for years and years of manuscript maps and published maps from way back the earliest map in our collection is from 
1500s, 1560. So we do have a lot of historical maps and um, they were just not findable. But also early um, Australian New Zealand land company maps, a huge number of um, uncatalogued maps from, from that century, 1880s, that around then, um, land district maps. And because my background originally was as a cataloger, I've been able to, um, you know, do that. But um, I'm not sure that that will continue. I've, I've made a huge inroads into the backlog, so I feel quite good about that. But as for digitisation, well, we're really on the back foot and we rely a lot on um, other institutions <laughs> to do that. But it, it, hopefully that will get it sorted. We have a huge manuscript collection as well. And um, I would do a lot of um, you know, joint research inquiries with other parts of the library and also other libraries around, around, the, around Australasia to get um, answers to people's questions. I think um, we, we've been lucky to have the specialised curator such as myself and, and other curators in each of our collections within our collection. Um, and I'm, I think that's been a good thing uh, because it's, it's a small library, I guess. So um, I think now, I'm not sure what will happen. I think they'll probably try to um, combine the curator match job with a liaison job role, which is what's been happening. Like the ephemera uh, curator and the music curator uh, have do part-time their specialties and part-time liaison where they go out to um, the departments and um, in the university and to other organisations to promote the collection. And we have school groups coming in as well and they um, use the materials in the collection. So I think that'll be the next step. I'm not sure if I've answered your question because I've forgotten what it was. But <laughs> Thank you, Karen, I think you have. Um, look, we've got a couple of questions from the audience. Um, uh, one of them was around digitisation and uh, that is um, in general, are physical maps, especially historical ones, only digitised when researchers request the information in this format? Um, and additionally, would the digitisation of these maps be at the expense of the researcher? Um, I mean, I, speaking from my experience, um, it's variable because as Maggie said, um, some parts of the collection have been digitised. Some of you might be in the more fortunate situation that um, all of your collection, if it's a smaller one, is, but uh, I, I suspect not. So um, does anyone have a particular passion for digitisation who would like to um, talk about that one? Um, Maggie. Well, David. Oh, David. Okay. David, I can see you waving. You're yeah, that, no, I was, I was, I was waving, not drowning there. I was, I was, I was trying to get I you. I was drowning. You were <laughs> um, I, I saw the questions as, as well, and I thought, all right, well, that's up my alley as well. I mean, the Melbourne Uni, I started, I digitalized the first um, material, map material at Melbourne Uni back in 1997, 90, 98, uh, and that went all over the world and got the attention of the University of California and, and just, just went nuts, and we've been digitalizing ever since. Uh, and the Melbourne University's expanded to now we have our own digitalization center center and that's got about five full-time uh, photographic professionals and we've got our own archive and we're steadily digitalizing material not necessarily at the request of researchers but at the the focus of the university where there's research and what have you that's and then if a researcher or a person asks for us, we have what's called a scan and send um, uh, process as well, where researchers uh, ad hocly ask for a material and we prioritise that and uh, push it through to, to scan that material and mm. when we can push it online. Um, and this morning I got a notification from our digitalization uh, and our digital archiving team that another collection of my maps has just been put online this morning, which is rare auction plans of Melbourne. Hold it a second, I can I, I can't access chat. 
I'd put it up there. But yeah, but that's um, a collection of uh, rare historic auction plans of Melbourne dating from, you know, I think it was 1870 to 1970. And I've put those all online now, uh, not at the request of a, a, a researcher, but just opportunistically, because a lot of them are gorgeous. And as well as there's a lot of research for it. I think the other part of the question is um, who among us practice cost recovery in this area or do we just absorb the costs? And I wonder whether um, perhaps um, Igor, Sarah, Andrew, Maggie, um, who have collections digitized, do you um, charge researchers for digitization? We, well, I mean, if they're, if they're digitized and they're on the catalog, then it's just a free download. We don't expect you to pay anything. and. Um, with our new map viewers, you can download whatever, you know, the highest res that we have within reason. Um, but we do expect people to pay if you want an absolutely unbelievably high res and it needs it to be a special order, then we might ask someone to pay for that. And yes, you know, if someone finds a map in our collection that hasn't been digitized and they need it, you know, then they may have to pay for it and then we thank them because it'll be to the benefit of all future researchers <laughs> if, they, if they just hang on you know there's some parts some corners of the collection we will never get to to digitize realistically and that is a user pays deal in that case we we started maggie just hearing you say it you know high standard etc we started digitizing back in about uh, the early 2000s and mm -hmm. um as we try and import things um, at the National Library into Map Search, we are finding the deficiencies of our yes. um, earlier digitization. Yeah. And we, yeah. we introduced 600 DPI as a standard um, for all map digitization in about 2014 15. Mm. Um, but uh, there is a long way to go, and there isn't a lot of appetite for redigitization, I must say. Um, unless the no. researcher then um, picks that up. But I wonder, Igor, did you have a, a view on that? Well, we started a little bit earlier than you with 600. Uh, I also attended a workshop on the uh, International Cartographic Association's um, Digital Cartographic Heritage, sorry, Cartographic Heritage into Digital, when they talked about vectorization of uh, old maps. And interestingly, most of the reports were that even 600 sometimes is not enough to do a proper vectorization. There is so much noise mm -hmm. uh, that actually make, makes me wonder what is the limit, where we should go with that. But, but we stuck with the 600 and, 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 and so on. Regarding the cost recovery, um, most of our digitization at the moment is done in response to requests from researchers. Uh, we're charging roughly $30. Uh, that is obviously much lower than the real cost of digitization and map, uh, but, uh, but um, we, we do recuperate some of these costs. One of the uh, problems I see uh, moving forward is that people cannot actually download high resolution images from NDHA. And this is a big problem for me. Um, uh, I do appreciate that there could be some copyright issues and, and so on, but even with the, the Creative Commons uh, maps, they are not available for download. And this is something that, that we are currently addressing at, at Tembo. So hopefully there will be some resolution to that. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, Igor. Um, we, we have a, a question about georeferencing um, from the audience. Um, do libraries hope to offer georeferenced versions of maps um, that can be utilized by um, geospatial specialists? Um, I think obviously we would like to. Um, how many of us are doing that perhaps? Um, the National Library is. <laughs> well, National Library um, New Zealand, if I can answer another question from um, Elizabeth Moylan, which was, um, about map search, how is the georeferencing going? Um, all, all of the uh, maps a bit were digit uh, were georeferenced within six months. So um, this was to me a lesson in, um, mind you, I would say ninety percent of them were done by one person. <laughs> uh, really, really uh, active, but uh, it really did. Uh, make it clear to me that once you offer people an opportunity to 
uh, deliver content in that form and they have an interest in following it up, they will follow it up. Um, so that, that activity worked really well, if I can answer that question myself, but um, have Martin, anyone else Martin, had similar experiences? Uh, well, as you know, we did a couple of georeferencing projects earlier and with our new catalogue, we've got some map viewers, but we're about to look at some different viewers, Martin, and probably do something like you have with a map search. But I'm just wondering whether or not the COVID lockdowns helped with your georeferencing, because can I say there was a lot Lots of digital volunteering going on. Do you think that was that was in your case a timely um, opportunity? Possibly. We we uh, I don't know about everybody else getting into that kind of opportunity about um, the last couple of years, but um, we introduced working from home projects among our staff. So we even gave um, you know georeferencing to our staff teams, and mm, they also yes. picked really rapidly as well. So yeah. um, the way it's designed is, is for people to engage with it. And I think my feeling is that if we could, um, you know, add, I mean, that they did georeference 10,000 maps in six months. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think you could go at that rate um, quite yeah. easily. It's really then how you're going to reutilize those. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as uh, whether, um, Andrew, have you been looking at those kinds of opportunities? Unfortunately, it's financial here. We haven't even just progressed down that route. I know the our state records office are looking down that route. They're looking at outsourcing digitization and also initially coordinating the material and then also using something like Ant the uh, optical recognition to actually assist with identifying names on the maps rather than actually go down to coordinating them but using the, the optorecision recognition software to actually search names on a map as opposed to a text trace or manuscript based system so it's an interesting different way of looking at it rather than the co uh, geo coordinated but my thoughts are I prefer to G look at geo coordinated and going forward but unfortunately we don't have that within our capabilities here at the moment uh, similar to us, Andrew, at State Library, Victoria. Um, don't know if you'd say we didn't have the resource. It's about uh, what the current priorities are. And uh, we did have a project that was very close to getting off the ground about 10 years ago. Um, but we're, we're piggybacking off other institutions at the moment. So um, the National Library and also the Public Record Office of Victoria, I think you might use the same system, um, Map Warper. Um, and it's very useful to be able to introduce our users to that um, because often we'll have similar or the same editions of maps um, that they can see uh, on the geo rectification system at the Public Record Office. Um, but yeah, we'd love to get something like that happening at the State Library um, and as Martin has mentioned it is amazing what you can achieve when you've got the power of the crowd behind you. And with object character recognition, you were mentioning, Andrew, that's another thing that was just so popular with um, the digitization of newspapers with Trove, with the public getting in on the action and um, correcting the transcription errors. You get sort of similar groups who are interested in um, coming up with coordinates for maps. Hey, look, I'm going to exercise my right as the MC on this one um, to skip a question briefly and go to another one. I know we've only got 10 minutes left, but this is an interesting question. Um, Glenn Wells, um, acquisition and cataloging workflows have tended to be based around maps that are resolved static items. Given that many agencies uh, that traditionally produce print maps are now focusing more on geospatial applications, um, where the cartographic information is dynamic, how does this affect acquisition and cataloging workflows? Would anyone like to tackle that meaty question? Or do we <laughs> deal with that offline? Uh, I'll have a crack <laughs> um, in terms of what users are wanting. Um, they're wanting the metadata or the uh, information about the information that's in the catalogue record. Um, and a lot of the savvy users are wanting that data to repurpose 
for themselves. So um, some people don't need to wait for the organisations to be innovative. They can just take the code or the appropriate information that's available from either the catalogue record or through um, the digital archive management system um, and, you know, feed that into their own applications. Um, so I think what libraries are needing to respond to uh, is looking at the kinds of information that people are wanting to be able to create their own content. Thanks, Sarah. Um, look, we've only got a few minutes and I did promise everybody an opportunity to spruik something interesting that they've been doing lately. So, <laughs> and I can see one or two people I know um, uh, champing at the bit to do that. So I'm going to hand off to Maggie, first of all. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I think maybe, Martin, what we could do perhaps in the future is actually have one of these um, seminars, which is purely about that cataloguing, georeferencing, um, data within the record, all of that sort of stuff, because I think there's a few people who would um, be interested in that sort of thing. Yes, look, I'm sorry, what I need to spruik is um, two things, two very important things. One is the, and I'm going to try and share my screen now. Um, let's just hope we're going to work. And um, can you see my image there? Yep. Uh, no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, I've shared the wrong thing. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to stop that share. I'm just going to tell you I'm going to try again because I've done it the wrong way. Okay. So first I'd like to spruik the exhibition that's just opened on the 13th of November, which is Maps of the Pacific. Um, I hope it's going to be a fantastic exhibition. It really, not only is it about focusing on maps of the position, but it's really trying to show uh, the extent of some of our collections and, and it's full of big, beautiful maps. And we have a special globe room. Uh, we've borrowed a couple of items from the Kerry Stokes collection, um, a couple of um, items from um, Rob Clancy's collection and from um, Rob Thomas's collection. So we've got uh, a few loans, but really it's just a big, bold, and I hope um, a great example of maps charts. And it's focusing on the Pacific and it's open till the 22nd of April. So it would be fantastic if you could come up and have a look at it. And the thing, next thing I really need to spruik is this one here, which is the conference, which is actually finally going to happen. And it's on the 2nd and 3rd of March. Uh, 2022. So it's our ANSMAX conference for the year, but it also um, involves the um, Society for the History of Discovery and also the International Map Collector Society. We've got two days of fantastic talks about um, mapping the Pacific, um, a couple of related events. So we would really like you to come along and we're hoping for registrations to open on Friday and we'll be sharing it through our ANSMAPS list. And can I just say that Anne's Maps also has a Twitter account and a Facebook page, so please look for them. And that's my promo. Is that okay, Martin? Excellent. You did that very expertly. You've done it before, Maggie. Well, um, who else would like to uh, talk about their, get on the soapbox and tell us something interesting about their collection that uh, is new? Probably I can do some, not quite as uh, elaborate as exhibitions and stuff. Uh, the State Library has just opened their, uh, launched their new website. And for the first time, we've actually put a page on their Pacific on maps and plans and charts. So it sort of explains what we have in a collection, different types of maps and that type of thing. So it's worth having a look at that at the State Library of West Australia. Thanks, Andrew. Um, would anyone else like to uh, talk about their plans? Um, and Igor, you're, you sound like you've got a lot on your plate um, remodelling um, your engagement strategy, um, your geospatial side. Is there something that you need to prioritise first? <laughs> there is actually nothing innovative about what we're trying to do initially, uh, and probably that will be the case for a few years. In uh, We we still need to work on our physical collections and obviously build up the geospatial collections. That will be our focus. We are looking at some ways of obviously engaging with communities, 
getting uh, their views on what we should be collecting, why we should be collecting, um, and, uh, and that will definitely inform our way forward. But with regards to innovative uh, librarianship or a greatership of, of maps, cartogra cartographic uh, collections and geospatial collections, I think that I've got nothing to report for, for a while now. There is a lot of work that needs to be done first. I might jump in after Igor. Um, it just strikes me that um, I think we think that the nuts and bolts of librarianship uh, is, uh, well, it's a grind and we often don't associate it with being innovative. Uh, and I would say that, you know, a big priority for the State Library and our new collection strategy is about those nuts and bolts, about getting things described so that people can find them online. Um, and I think to do that, you're dealing with, um, you know, uh, what we call legacy collections that are going back sometimes hundreds of years. And um, it doesn't seem very exciting, but I think you have to be innovative in the relationships that you, you build across the organisation to get these things done. Um, but I'll also just uh, take the time to spruik an exhibition <laughs> that's going to be on at the State Library of Victoria next year. Uh, and it's in a, a new exhibition gallery that was part of the, the redevelopment. And um, it centres around an amazing acquisition, um, which is a giant knitted star map. Um, which shows uh, the constellation of the, of the southern skies. And um, it was created by a local artist uh, and computer engineer. Uh, and um, she's been involved in hackathons in the past where she hacked a domestic knitting machine and created her own algorithm. Um, so this exhibition is looking at coding and craft and navigation. And it looks to be happening, I think opening in March next year. So look out for that. Thanks, Sarah. I know we're drawing to a close and I would only echo what you said. I thought that was well put about engagement um, can be innovate, innovation. Um, they're almost the same thing. It's endless the ways in which you can communicate with people and use maps to do that um, but you know we all have our own ways of um, attempting to do it and the organization um, puts barriers in the way sometimes opportunities um, for the for you to uh, to follow so um, uh, I thank you for that uh, and I, I thank all our speakers today for their um, uh, generosity in providing their thoughts and ideas um, I'm, I'm really um, pleased as well that the idea that there are so many people who are interested in the bedrock and how we provide access and can we catalog collections I think um, we do need to share that information we've we've done that previously in the last say 20 years in mm. and maps and uh, you know I'm, I'm still hearing uh, interest in that topic so there's some of those bedrock bottom line things are not quite there for for map collections as I kind of from the National Library, um, assume they are, um, because our situation is is quite well organised, um, but it's not the same for everybody. And I, I think we've all got a lot of expertise to share. So perhaps that could be a session mm -hmm. for us next year. Um, we will offer a, a, a season of talks next year. Um, it might be slightly modified um, as a result of the conference in the early part of the year, but. Uh, I think the um, the idea of uh, webinars where we share information is uh, the way to go and solve some of our uh, regional issues and also our opportunities for sharing information um, between Australia and New Zealand and also across the range of collections that we've got. So uh, thanks everybody for um, participating. David, there's a question for you there that we'll take note of um, if you haven't answered it already. Um, but once again, um, before I sign off, is there anything else anyone wanted to say? I was just going to put some links to the exhibition and to the conference into the chat. Okay, so don't sign off everything till I've done that. We can include that and circulate those links um, 
as well, Maggie. Okay. Um, once again, thanks, everybody. And uh, mm -hmm. happy Christmas, New Year, uh, if I don't speak to you um, prior to 2022. Um, thank you very much to Greg, uh, to Greg for uh, organising the session and for Brendan um, for inviting people. But thanks again to our speakers, um, to Andrew, David, Igor, Karen, um, Maggie and Sarah. And farewell. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.